Hello and good afternoon. The Public Outreach and Education Committee of the Astronomical Society of India welcomes you to the discussion series, Ask an Astronomer. I am Sarita Vick and joining me are Dr. Virendra Yadav and Dr. Crispin Karthik from the ASI POEC. Our eminent astronomer for today is Professor Nirupam Roy from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And our theme for discussion is Realm of the Unseen, Radio Astronomy, and the Upcoming Square Kilometer Array. Professor Nirupam will be giving a short presentation, which will be followed by a discussion. I invite our participants and viewers to note down their questions in the chat box. I welcome Professor Nirupam to the discussion. I request Dr. Virendra to introduce our guest astronomer before the presentation. Over to you, Virendra. Thank you, Saritaji. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, so, Professor uh, Nirupam Roy, he did uh, his uh, BE in Mechanical Engineering in uh, 2003, and then he moved on uh, to TIFR, where he did his uh, MSc and PhD in Physics. So, uh, it's possible even for uh, engineering background people to uh, get into astronomy, as you have an example right in front of us. Then uh, he did... Uh, uh, postdoctoral uh, stints in uh, National Radio Astronomy Observatory, USA, and then uh, Max Planck Institute, Germany. <clears throat> he was uh, assistant professor at uh, IIT Kharagpur, and then he moved uh, uh, to ISC Bangalore, Indian Institute of Science, where uh, he is currently based. And uh, he was also an ambassador scientist uh, uh, at <clears throat> uh, Alexander von uh, Humboldt Foundation. And uh, he's uh, the convener of the joint astronomy program at ISC for the past few years. He has won many fellowships and awards. And uh, he got uh, Infosys uh, Foundation Young Investigator Award uh, in 2017, the INSA Medal for Young Scientist in 2013, Humboldt Postdoctoral Fellowship in uh, 2013, and uh, Jansky Postdoctoral Fellowship in 2009. Is a member of many professional uh, bodies like uh, International Astronomical Union, International Union of Radio Science, and uh, he's also the life member of Astronomical Society of India. And in addition to this, he's also uh, the representative and active member of Square Kilometer Array India Consortium. And <clears throat> uh, many uh, such bodies where uh, professional astronomers uh, devote time to uh, the uh, developmental aspects of uh, various facilities and programs. Professor Roy has more than uh, 75 uh, published uh, papers in international and national peer-reviewed journals. And uh, with this, uh, I conclude the introduction and I request uh, Professor Roy to start with the talk today. And uh, you are on mute. Uh, could you unmute, Professor Roy? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Can Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Priyanda, for the introduction. And thanks to all the organizers for giving this chance to uh, talk um, from this platform today. Um, so I will start sharing my screen. And I hope all of you can see this. Uh, so today uh, we are going to discuss about uh, radio astronomy and the upcoming square kilometer array. So I have a, a brief presentation as the primer to start this discussion. Now, astronomy and astrophysics, it's a very interesting branch of science and arguably the oldest branch of science where the aim of this branch of science is to 
look around the universe and try to understand it by, of course, taking various measurements. So to do science, you have to do it quantitatively, taking various measurements. And one can argue it started as early as maybe 5,000 years ago when people built this uh, Stonehenge structure to uh, see alignment of um, the rise and set of different celestial objects in different time of the year. And from that 3000 uh, BC structure to do some very primitive form of um, quote unquote astronomy at that time, uh, today we have of course uh, moved uh, uh, far, far ahead from here due to development of technology. And today when we think about um, astronomy, we think about the instruments that are in use, um, we think about telescopes, this is what normally comes to my mind. This is a very uh, in interesting site, a very uh, a good site for doing astronomical observation in uh, Hawaii Monarch Observatory. It's about 4,000 meter altitude. You get very clear sky uh, most of the nights. And you can see um, so many domes visible here, which basically house different uh, telescopes, right? Now, uh, this dome structure is what normally come to our mind because most of these, of course, contain what is normally called optical telescope. And it's because astronomy started for us as optical astronomy for the very natural reason that when we as human beings look up um, to the sky, look down, our eyes are sensitive to the light which is um, in the visible range of the electromagnetic spectrum. And hence, uh, for obvious reason, we started looking at the optical emission from the sky, from stars and um, nebulas and so on. And then later when the telescopes come, um, we again uh, uh, started with optical astronomy as such. But this is not the world view for everyone. If you think about even uh, very common um, animals around us, us, for example, an owl's worldview is very, very different from a human's worldview. Owl uh, can actually see infrared radiation at night, and that's how it uh, catches its prey. So even in the dark, the infrared radiation, which is coming because of the body temperature of its um, uh, prey, it can actually take it. So if you now think of a, a very powerful eyes, uh, which are sensitive to this infrared radiation, the same thing which uh, look to our human eye, in which is detecting only the optical Wave. So this is Orion Nebula, which all of us uh, probably have at some point or, or other looked up at the sky and found the Orion, identified it by its uh, belt and this uh, the nebulosity here, which is the very well-known uh, Orion Nebula here. Many of us may also have looked uh, at it through um, you know small or uh, medium-sized uh, optical telescope. Same thing if instead of having um, our eye, which can look at optical rays only, if we could have got the power of an owl and could have looked at it in the UV radiation, it would have looked completely different. It would have looked very, very different from what we can see otherwise. So what you see here um, is an actual infrared image of the same region. Now, as you can see that these two pictures bring up the very different type of thing which are radiating in this region, optical, which is mostly dominated by light, which is coming from only the stars and some nebulous emission here. Whereas this infrared radiation is dominated by the gas and dust, which is present in the same region. It's a very different story, a completely different story. And when we put together this, we can understand the celestial object, the celestial pheno phenomenon, much better than what we can understand by just looking at and using the optical light. So starting from the very old, in fact, the first telescope which has been used for doing optical um, astronomy, this is the telescope which Galileo used. These are some of the very first results that we have got in the modern science astronomy in a, in a way, how moons look looks like through his telescope, how Jupiter's moon are changing um, the relative position when he looked looked at it um, through his telescope somewhere around 1609 or 10. From there, it, the, the way as the optical telescope has actually moved forward 
and today thanks to all the technological development we even have telescopes which are uh, first of all much bigger and then also floating on the sky orbiting the the earth and taking amazing pictures so i don't think i need to uh, tell you that this is the um, image of the hubble space telescope which has produced um, extraordinary quality images and delivered so much uh, science so there has been a uh, long progress in optical astronomy of course but what has happened is in the meantime we have also widened our window so not just sticking to the optical window to study the universe around us we have actually gone into all these various levels where one can use this different type of telescope to probe the entire spectrum of the electromagnetic wave now we know that electromagnetic wave and light is only a small range of frequency or wavelength of the electromagnetic wave it span from very high energy wave in the gamma ray and x ray end to the ultraviolet uh, wave that is uh, slightly lower energy and then the visible light that we can see directly uh, with our naked eyes or through the regular telescope that we talk about and then we have infrared telescopes and then we have um, radio waves which are much longer now and then very very long wavelength um, radio waves all of these are now used in modern day astronomy and astrophysics to probe the universe to get the best possible picture of the celestial objects and the phenomena to draw a more complete understanding of these objects and the phenomena now of course there is one thing which we have to um, keep in mind that we live in a planet which has an atmosphere and this atmosphere has something called opacity how much light can actually pass through and come all the way to the surface where we can get it and unfortunately the atmosphere is such that unfortunately for ast astronomy for this purpose is such that there are only very few small windows where the opacity is low enough that the light from the celestial object from the sky can actually penetrate all the way and come here on the surface hence optical window where the opacity is quite low it is possible to do astronomy by setting up this ground based observation so you can put your telescope here on the surface of earth on on ground and look at the star which is coming and penetrating through the atmosphere and reaching us here however it is not possible at all other wavelength because of various phenomena which is causing the atmospheric opacity the the ref, ref, reflection scattering and absorption hence for many other wavelengths for example in gamma ray and x ray to some extent even in uv to a good extent in the infrared and in the long wavelength uh, radio waves one need to send these telescopes this de detector outside the atmosphere so they have to be space borne however we are lucky enough to have one more window here which is also sort of open in the sense that the atmospheric opacity here is low enough that you can have observatories on the ground and these are this is the radio uh, wavelength region so at radio wavelengths similar to optical astronomy it's quite possible to do ground based observation quite uh, um, in a in a simple manner so there is no complication of sending your telescope to uh, space basically for the radio waves so again um uh, because of this the radio astronomy is a branch of science which has developed where ground based observation is possible and we have got apart from this big eye on the sky that i have shown that astronomers are using to look at the universe and understand more about it we have also got this other kind of the eyes which are on the grounds which are known as radio telescopes now if i look at the earlier picture that i have shown as telescope or even this one this is what we normally imagine as how a telescope look like but when we look at this picture this is not how normally we imagine how a telescope look like interestingly the, this type of structure is what is often depicted in popular culture to be what is used for contacting extraterrestrial intelligence so it is a very in, interesting idea that if you look at Uh, in movies or series or cartoons or something when we draw these um, when they draw normally these antenna etc and then someone actually putting an headphone and listening to extraterrestrial intelligence trying to contact us or something but uh, we normally do not think of this as telescopes but 
as I'm going to show you, these are exactly, um, uh, they, they, be, they are actually telescopes exactly like we have the optical, but it's just that they're operating at that radio wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum. So here, what I'm showing you is part of a telescope. It's an antenna, actually. So we'll call it an antenna. And it's part of a telescope known as the Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope, or GMRT. Many of you um, may have heard of it. It's located somewhere close to uh, Pune, between Pune and Nasik. And it's one of the most powerful radio telescopes that currently exists that is operating at the low frequency end of the um, electromagnetic spectrum within the radio wavelength. So this is a giant uh, size telescope. It, its diameter is 45 meter compared to, for example, your uh, Hubble Space Telescope, which is a very powerful optical telescope, which is only about um, uh, two meter. So in optical, the big telescopes are of the order of one meter, one, one two meter. They are like quite uh, good. The largest ones are of the order of let's say 10 meters or so. And the biggest ones that are being built or will be built um, uh, shortly are of the order of 30 meters. However, the radio telescopes are much, much bigger in size for the reason that if you want to achieve an image of which is showing the details at the similar accuracy as your optical telescope, which the technical term for this is resolution. So if I want to get the same resolution from my radio telescope comparable to my optical telescope, then because the radio wavelengths are much longer, the electromagnetic, in the electromagnetic spectrum, the radio wavelengths are much longer. And hence, there is a fundamental limit uh, which comes from a quantum mechanical uncertainty principle, which tells me that my size of the telescope also has to be much bigger to get that similar type of resolution. So you keep on increasing the wavelength of your observation, your telescope also has to be bigger and bigger. So this GMRT antenna is in fact 45 meter in, in diameter, much bigger than a typical um, optical telescope, but that is even not adequate to give you a good resolution image. So all radio telescopes does not look similar, of course. Here I'm showing only one antenna of a telescope. And what the, what the look at is, for example, if you think of what your um, eyes can look at in optical wavelength, if you look at the night sky, you can see the moon, the planets, the stars. And if you are lucky enough to get a dark sky, you can see the patch of our galaxy. If you now think of an uh, eye like GMRT, which is looking at the sky and seeing what is called the radio sky, you will again see something like this. So this is a, a composite image, a false color image in, in some way because radio does not really have the color that has been put here for the sky. So this is a false color image for uh, showing it uh, how the brightness of radio emission that is coming from the sky is distributed, um, uh, collage of the radio sky with some radio telescopes here, as you can see. And you may, at the first glance, it may look like very, very similar. You see all the stars here, you see a similar feature on the radio sky. But you have to realize one, one thing at this point, this radio sky that we are looking at here is in fact much, much more interesting than what you see in the night sky picture. All the sources here, all these star-like things that are dotted over the entire region, none of these are actually stars, okay? So this radio sky actually contain some of these sources that you can see some extended structure here. All, all these structures are likely within our Milky Way galaxy. However, all these star-like structures, none of them are star, none of them are inside our galaxy. In fact, they are very, very far away objects which have this very compact, almost point-like, like they, that is why they look star-like, almost point-like, very bright radio emission. And it turned out that all these points, they are actually associated with something called um, AGNs, the active galactic nuclei. So these are very far away galaxy. The central part of the galaxy is very bright in radio. And they are very bright in radio because at the central part of this galaxy, there are supermassive black holes and all these supermassive black holes, the accretion process which are happening that is giving rise to some non-thermal synchrotron emission that are being picked up at radio frequencies. So unless this image here, which shows you the optical night sky, 
this radio night sky is not showing you stars but it's showing you the position of all the supermassive black holes in this part of the sky apart from of course this extended region some extended emission which are coming from our galaxy and which also are very very interesting on their own right they are normally either the remnant of the explosion of massive star which are known as supernova remnant or the region which has been ionized around some star the the gas which has been ionized around stars and hence um, emitting a large amount of radio emission so you see this image contains so much information about all the supermassive black holes very very far away from our galaxy and also very interesting phenomena that is happening in our galaxy that are mostly not accessible to us through optical telescopes only now exactly like i mentioned the all the progress in optical telescope and technology from galileo's time all the way to hubble space telescope where we can have a telescope which is put on the sky for radio also there is a similar history that one can look at and all this started less than um, 100 years ago so around 1930 carl jansky who was working from a telephone company at&t he was trying to look for some extra noise that they were getting in their telephone lines during conversation and carl jansky built this receiver system that image you can um, see here it's a rotating receiver system i'm calling it here telescope but jansky did not built it as a telescope he built it to probe something else he wanted to know why this extra hissing sound is coming during this telephone communication this radio communication and he was able to find out the source of this hissing most of it was actually coming because of some thunderstorm etc but there was one extra component which was not related to any of the known sources uh, on on earth and it turned out that that's that the signal from that extra source is repeating every 23 hours 56 minutes and then astronomers were readily able to identify that because of this repetition period being 23 hours 56 minutes which is same as the sidereal day time scale it must be something in the sky so some signal is coming in radio frequency which is being picked up by this rotating antenna so jansky was the first person to detect the radio emission coming from a celestial source using this uh, telescope and when people came to know about it there was of course a lot of interest and so on and there was an um, uh, in a in a way amateur astronomer grote reber he built a 9 meter this antenna and started looking at the sky and try to finding out where else from they are getting the signal and try to start mapping the sky and so on so these are the few of the far, you know the first and the second radio telescopes that has ever been built and this is all like uh, 90 and 80 years ago roughly and again from there similar to the progress in optical astronomy we have moved uh, uh, quite a bit so Uh, this here for example the image i am showing is known as the effelsberg radio telescope and you can now compare it with the first 9 meter disc here to the disc that you are getting here which is 100 meter in diameter as i mentioned to reach the same level of resolution for radio telescope you need to build bigger and bigger size telescopes because the radio wavelengths are much longer so even a 100 meter telescope is not really uh, Um, uh, compared to the typical optical telescope but this is the big this is sort of the biggest size that one can achieve technologically uh, for an antenna which is steerable so this is one of the um, largest steerable radio telescope that we have, other one being the in diameter now so here there there is a very interesting step jump that i am going to inform you about so people realize that instead of building this single giant huge antennas of 100 200 300 meter and so on in fact the largest radio telescope that we have today is about 500 meter in diameter called the fast telescope but that is not steerable you cannot move it so it's sort of on the ground and whatever sky come on top of it only that can be observed so people realize that instead of building this um giant single telescope there can be some very novel technique of actually building multiple smaller antennas and then combine the signal from them together so that they will act as a single telescope 
So here what I show you is such a telescope known as the very large array. So radio telescopes can be broadly classified into two different types. One, which is a single dish telescope, a giant dish, which is operating on its own as a, a single antenna operating as a single telescope. You can also have multiple antennas, which are built and the data is combined in such a way that it work as a single telescope together. So this telescope known as the very large array is actually a combination of 27 antenna. Each of them are 25 meter in diameter. Similar to GMRT, where each antenna, I have shown you one antenna, which is 45 meter in diameter, but there are 30 of them, which together work as a single telescope. And by doing that, you can effectively build a much bigger telescope. For example, VLA, the antennas can be spread up to 20, 30 kilometer distance from each other. So a huge region of about 30 kilometer diameter, you place your antenna over that region and collect the signal from them, combine them together so that it works as a single telescope. For GMRT, similarly, all the 30 antennas are spread around over a region of 25 kilometer diameter. So you effectively get a 25 kilometer diameter telescope that uh, give you a resolution which is now comparable to the optical telescopes. Now, all radio telescopes does not look like this, this antenna, of course. There are various other designs. For example, this is a photograph of a loafer station where you uh, have this uh, stick-like thing, uh, which are basically some dipole antenna, and you can connect the signal from there, collect together. This is the UTI radio telescope. Again, one of the very interesting telescope we have in India, which is a 500 meter long and about 23 meter wide cylindrical telescope. So you can have these various design. The aim of all of these are finally looking at the sky, detecting the radio signal from there and trying to image the radio emission that is coming from the sky. Of course, as you can understand, once you have so many elements and you want to combine the signal from there, there has to be very complicated and challenging data analysis. So particularly in this mode where you have the array, multiple antenna components, which together work as a single telescope, you don't get to image the sky directly. Not, not like the optical telescope, which look at the sky and you can put a CCD and capture the image. Here you get very complicated raw data in terms of some correlation of the electric field in different um, antennas. I'm not getting into that details. And then there are very complex process of data analysis with this type of raw data of uh, millions of points that you have, captured, you have recorded that can be then analyzed and the process will give you the image of the sky. Either you are, you know, here are two examples, either you are looking at some extended uh, region of radio emission or looking at a re region from where you get to see a uh, lot of sources together and so on. So uh, please remember the idea that once you have a complex systems like multiple antenna working together as a single telescope, the data analysis become more and more challenging and complicated to reach the final image. Now, what do we learn by doing all these things? As I mentioned at the beginning, that it gives us a very complete picture of the celestial objects and the emission mechanism and the phenomenon. Here is one example where I showed our Milky Way galaxy. And you have seen the optical emission from Milky Way galaxy. Some of you have already seen this image also earlier, which shows the star and the gas. But as you can see, when I look at the same thing in radio, uh, these top three panels are basically radio images of Milky Way galaxy at different frequency. One of them is at low frequency at 408 megahertz. And it's showing me where all the relativistic electrons are basically accelerating in presence of magnetic field and radiating synchrotron emission. So it, it is not showing me emission from stars or dust or, or so on. It's showing me presence of magnetic field and relativistic electrons and showing me the synchrotron emission. This one is at 1.4 gigahertz or 21 centimeter. There is a spectral line which is being emitted from atomic hydrogen. So wherever in the galaxy you have atomic hydrogen, you will be able to detect this radio emission from that direction. So this show me, apart from all these stars, there is a huge amount of atomic hydrogen gas in the galaxy. And this one is a trace of the molecular gas in our galaxy. So this is a 115 gigahertz radio image. And there is a similar spectral line transition of the CO molecule 
at this frequency and we know from various other studies that co and the carbon monoxide and the molecular hydrogen they are very closely related they coexist in different region in the in the galaxy so if i can map the distribution i can image where the co is lying i will also know sort of where this molecular gas is lying so this is how we can get a get a more complete picture of the galaxy here is another example which really show the part which is otherwise unseen in the sense that if you look at these three galaxies in optical uh, image they look like completely unrelated in in some sense this is m81 m82 and ngc 3077 galaxies if i look at the same galaxy using my radio telescope and image the neutral hydrogen gas around them you can see how much interaction is going on between these galaxies this clearly come out how the galaxies are interesting and you can model their their movement etc very accurately once you have this information from the radio telescope not just the neutral hydrogen gas of course the interstellar gas contains numerous other molecules apart from co which i have already mentioned and radio telescope has also played see very important role in for example detecting bio precursor uh, molecules so uh, some day probably we will also know through this type of studies how life started in earth where from all this raw material uh, came for the first time in a way so here now i will quickly move to last part where i want to talk about what lies in future i i have shown you some of the radio telescopes that are the currently best radio telescopes operating throughout all over the world and what type of observation can one do and what can one learn but looking forward um, i want to talk a little bit about this square kilometer array now which is a global research infrastructure which is being built through an international collaboration so square kilometer array is basically the most ambitious radio astronomy project that has ever been attempted to all, do cutting edge science in all these frontiers area it will be a huge telescope about 30 times of this giant meter wave radio telescope that we currently have and if you see how with different type time different year the sensitivity of telescope has improved steadily the square kilometer array will lie somewhere here much above the currently existing telescopes it will have a very wide frequency range a large number of antennas and it will be located in australia and south africa there will be two part of it one part looking at the low frequency sky one part looking at the mid frequency sky and it is now in the construction phase the construction has already started so if you look at the region here in australia marked with this box and this region here in south africa marked with this box this is some of the region which are very radio quiet region in in uh, the globe and that's why these two regions have been chosen to build the sk telescopes here this is some artist depiction of how the square kilometer array radio telescope will finally look like this consists of some 130000 antenna spread across 65 km that's how it is planned to cover 50 to 350 megahertz this part will have about 200 dis uh, uh, antennas Uh, connected together to work as a single telescope 15 meter each across the 150 km diameter and the range of science that the sk will be able to do is um, incredible from starting from looking at the planet formation and understanding this molecular um, uh, tracers in different part of the galaxy all the way to learning about cosmology and dark energy and the evolution of the universe um in the cosmic dawn and the epoch of renaissance this entire range of science is covered by um, what sk can uh, do when it comes online so i will very briefly maybe uh, in 2 minutes i'll try to um, talk about at least one of the science case that sk will be able to do um to the best possible way when it comes online and that has to do with this last one which is listed here the cosmic dawn and the epoch of reionization so uh, all of you probably know that hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe and so it's also the best tracer to know about the cosmic evolution of our universe how things have uh, changed with time how structure um has started forming and how they have evolved to form the galaxy and stars and galaxy that we see today so one of the image which 
most of you may have seen earlier known as the cosmic microwave background radiation uh, map it sort of give us a snapshot of how the structures of the universe was at one point of the time when the universe was about 1 million year old from the point of big bang right now from there this entire range of evolution nothing much is known about this period of the universe's evolution which is known as the dark ages and this is in fact the period when the first stars started coming up and the first supernova and black holes occurred and so on we know a lot about things here at a much later time when the galaxies have formed and we have deep galaxy survey and so on but there is a chunk of the period of universe's overall cosmic evolution where there is very little information that is available and sk when it comes online it will be able to look at this part of the cosmic evolution at great details to see how the neutral hydrogen content during this time from the period of dark ages cosmic dawn and the epoch of reionization how this period the structures are forming and evolving and so on we have some idea about how the uh, structure have formed but no details are yet known or observationally established so from here i will just mention very briefly about india's participation in sk as i mentioned this is an international collaborative project with multiple countries involved the telescopes will be in australia and in south africa but there are as you can see from these colors these are the countries which are involved some 10 countries uh, so far and india is one of the country who uh, is very involved in this sk project from the beginning it is a full member of the sk organization and it will be a, a full partner institute in the um, sk observatory uh, we have something called sk india consortium a collection of more than 20 institute from which the uh, scientists work together for india's contribution towards the uh, square kilometer array through different science working group and gmrt has been identified as a uh, sk pathfinder so for both science and technology development this telescope will be used so that things that are being well tested and working for gmrt will be adopted for a uh, square kilometer array um, india is also expected to lead something called the observatory management and control system production so in the designing of this control system india has played a very key role and will uh, is expected to lead the production of that as well as contribute in the antenna and receiver as and the central signal processing system and we are most likely develop a square kilometer array regional center for data processing also in india so we are all looking forward very eagerly because square kilometer array has already entered the um, phase where the construction has begun and uh, we are looking for forward um india india's formal joining the consortium uh, which is expected to happen very soon so with this i will stop this presentation here uh, and i just want to sort of um dedicate this presentation in memory of professor gobind sarup who is known as the uh, father of radio astronomy in india most of the things that i mentioned in india the gmrt the uti radio telescopes and all of these is built because of um, gobin who started this interesting branch of science in india and he built the uti radio telescope and built the giant meter wave radio telescope and he was one of the person who um, a long time ago envisioned a square kilometer array like telescope finally which is going to um, uh, you know which the the um, making the telescope has started uh, last year um so with that i will stop and then uh, we will move to the discussion part thank you thank you nirupam that was very nice uh, introduction to radio astronomy and i hope our audience uh, has uh, been able to appreciate because usually we just uh, talk about optical astronomy because that is something that is more traditional uh, i was just curious about uh, for example in one of your slides you showed lot of photographs of milky way at different frequencies and you mentioned something about electrons relativistic electrons maybe and it, there was another picture in which you said that this is atomic hydrogen and then molecular hydrogen so maybe can you tell how we know for example for the benefit of our audience that uh, just uh, as a curiosity because they are very different states of matter right 
Yes, yes. So, um, so uh, any galaxy, uh, if we look at the um, the component of that galaxy, um, we we basically have the stars which are uh, readily identified. We know the galaxy is collection of stars, but apart from the stars, um, all galaxies they contain what is known as the interstellar medium. Interstellar medium is basically the gas and dust which is very pervasive in these uh, galaxies and it's uh, the very low density medium low in the in the normal sense low density medium which is there in the galaxy and it goes through this um, cycle of forming a star from there so you have the low density gas which condense form more stars and towards the end of the life cycle of star the matter uh, started coming back to the uh, interstellar medium again through um, either slow processes like stellar wind and ejection of the outer region and so on. So there is a, or supernova explosion. So there is a cyclic process in which the gas and stars are connected. Now, this gas, it can exist in um, very different conditions. Some of it can be very uh, hot, like very high temperature up to 10 to the power 6 Kelvin or so, and will be highly ionized. So it will be um, collection of protons and electrons basically whereas other part of the gas it can remain in the uh, atomic phase slightly lower in temperature something like um, maybe few thousand kelvin or even as low as 100 kelvin and then there is a gas which is even more colder which can go up to a uh, few kelvin temperature and then it um, is mostly in the molecular phase now this this gas they can be traced this molecular gas, atomic gas, or ionized gas, they can be traced by using this different um, uh, type of radiation that are coming from these components. The atomic gas, and again, as I mentioned, hydrogen is the most abundant element. So when I'm talking about atomic gas, most of it is actually atomic hydrogen. And then there will be trace amount of other gas, other gases like helium, carbon, nitrogen, and so on, but most of it is hydrogen gas. It so happened that the hydrogen gas, the, the energy level of hydrogen gas are such that the, the um, electrons, uh, very ground state of the electrons has a little bit of splitting of the energy because the way the uh, proton and the electron spins are coupled. And the difference of that little bit of energy is... Um, uh, if one electron goes from, you know, there, there is a transition between these two level of energy, um, then we get emission coming out from there, which comes at the radio frequency range. So this 21 centimeter emission, the most celebrated spectral line in, in some sense in radio frequency, comes from this, which is known as the hyperfine transition um, in atomic hydrogen. So if you detect the spectral line of 21 centimeter in any direction, you know that it is coming from the neutral hydrogen gas from that direction. So if I now use my radio telescope to make an image of how much is the intensity of the 21 centimeter emission from that direction, the 21 centimeter spectral line emission from that direction, it tells me how much gas is there. So the image that you see here, it has been um, created exactly the same way. You look at all different direction in the sky and try to find out how much of this 21 centimeter spectral line signal you are getting from different direction. And it brings out the atomic hydrogen distribution in our galaxy. You see this bright part. So uh, I mentioned briefly that these images are false color image. There is no real color of radio emission, of course. So here red is denoting from where more emission is coming and blue is denoting where some medium moderate range of emission is coming and this one is denoting very low level of emission. So this is basically telling me that there is a lot of gas on this galactic disk on the plane where a lot of hydrogen gas, atomic hydrogen gas is residing. And then there is sort of a slightly more thicker disk of atomic hydrogen which is there. In a similar way, there is also spectral line transition which comes from the uh, molecular gas. Here, the spectral line transition at 115 gigahertz 
This comes from CO molecule, the carbon monoxide molecule. So again, you can take a radio telescope which can detect 115 gigahertz radio emission and look at it in all different direction in the sky and try to make an image of from where how much emission is coming. You can uh, make this image of the molecule, the the CO molecule uh, distribution in the sky, which is very tightly related to where the molecular hydrogen is distributed. And again, here you see that this is mostly confined to the plane of the disk of Milky Way. So this atomic and molecular hydrogen, they are residing mostly on the disk of the hydrogen. And then we have this image, which is at 408 megahertz. This is um, radio emission, but from the nature of this radio emission, we know that this is synchrotron emission. Now, synchrotron emission is what? Synchrotron emission happens when we have very highly energetic population of electron which are moving in presence of magnetic field. They radiate the synchrotron emission and hence this is a very different type of radiation than the spectral line 21 centimeter or 115 gigahertz from atomic and uh, atomic gas and the molecular gas. This is coming from this synchrotron emission is coming from the region where there has to be magnetic field and then there has to be some highly energetic electron population. So this turned out to be, this synchrotron emission turned out to be a good tracer of the ionized gas in, in the galaxy. So here you of course see that there is a good contribution which is coming from close to the galactic plane, but on top of that there is also widespread synchrotron emission which is coming from our galaxy, which is not only on the plane, but also outside the plane. So it's almost like there is a halo of gas around the disk where you have this presence of magnetic field and the uh, relativistic, the high energy electrons. Yeah, thanks Nirupam. That was uh, good because it was, I hope uh, that is clear to the audience. Uh, Virendra, you have any questions? Uh, would you like to ask something before we go on to the audience questions? It's a very general question. So I think I'll ask uh, towards the end probably. Okay. All right. So, uh, we'll, we'll move on to the questions uh, by the participants. Uh, so, the first question, some of them probably have already answered during the course of the talk because uh, these were posted as the talk was going on. But nevertheless, if you can briefly tell, it will be good. Uh, Anshita wanted to know, my question is that why do we need more number of these antennas as radio telescopes, whereas like Hubble telescope is just one, right? right. You did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I answered it, but let me just reiterate on that answer yeah. uh, once more. Uh, see, there is there is one very fundamental uh, uh, relation which limit at what accuracy we can uh, make these images. And wh when I mean, uh, what I mean by accuracy is that, let us say this image you see here, Okay, and you see these uh, two very bright star-like sources which are uh, located close to each other. The question is, how can I separate, is it possible uh, to what, up to what separation I can uh, find, I can say that these are two sources and it, it is basically what my, the resolution of my telescope is. If there are two stars or two galaxies or you know two AGNs which are very closely spaced, I can only separate them if my telescope has a very high resolution. Or you can think about an image like this. You can see all this small scale structure, the variation of the emission on small scale. This is possible because I have a high resolution image of this re region. So if I have a higher resolution, then I basically get information about the detailed structure of these sources. Okay. So higher resolution is always desirable. Now, the resolution of a telescope, it is related to the wavelength at which I am observing and the diameter of the telescope. It actually goes approximately as 1.22 times lambda by d. And as I mentioned, it comes from some very fundamental uh, limit imposed by um, uncertainty principle. So this 1.22 lambda by d, which decide the resolution of my telescope, tells me that if my wavelength at which I am carrying out the observation is longer, then to reach the same resolution, 
I have to use the D, the diameter of the telescope, which also has to be bigger. Now, optical wavelength, optical wavelength is very short compared to the radio wavelength. So the optical diameter of a one meter or two meter can already give you very good resolution, which a one meter or two meter diameter radio telescope will not give you. In radio telescope, to reach the same level of resolution, you need to use a much bigger diameter telescope. Now, technologically, it is very challenging to build something which is bigger than this about 100 meter diameter and still keep it steerable, a moving telescope. So 100 meter is roughly sort of the limit up to which the current technology can make a good dish which is movable. So the other way of doing it is something which is known as aperture synthesis. So aperture synthesis technique is what is used by radio astronomers very frequently that you use, instead of making a single big antenna, you make many antennas which are mo moderately uh, big, not very big. So these are, for example, these are 25 meter in diameter, which is quite uh, possible with the current technology. So you big this moderate size disk, but build many of them and spread them over a region and collect data from them and combine them in a clever way so that you use all these antennas together as a single telescope. And this is known as aperture synthesis, the interferometry and aperture synthesis. And that gives me information about the structure in the sky as if I am using a telescope which is of this large diameter. So VLA will take these 27 antennas and spread them over a diameter of say 30 kilometer and collect the signal, combine them in a way as if the 27 antenna work together as a single telescope of 30 kilometer diameter. Similarly, the array telescope or the interferometer GMRT, I have shown here only one antenna, but it consists of similar antenna, same size antenna, 30 of them which are spread over a region of 25 kilometer diameter. So GMRT, when you combine all the data in this interferometric mode, it works as a telescope, which is effectively a 25 kilometer diameter telescope. And you can keep on making this size bigger and bigger. In fact, there is a technique which is called VLBI, the very large baseline interferometry, which can take record signal from telescopes which are almost diametrically opposite point of arc and then combine them cleverly together offline to build a telescope which is of the size of the entire arc. And uh, many of you will probably remember a very uh, interesting result which came out um, four years ago, I believe, from... 2019, right? 2000. Uh, yeah, it was 2019. 19. 19. Okay, so, so uh, three years ago, from the Event Horizon Telescope, the Event Horizon Telescope produced the first um, direct high-resolution image of a um, central black hole of a, of a uh, galaxy. And that image was made um, using this VLBI technique. So multiple radio telescopes, which are located in different part of the globe, they observe simultaneously and then the data are recorded and combined in such a way that you are effectively using a telescope, which is of the size of the entire earth, 6,400 kilometer diameter. Okay. So this technique is a very powerful technique to get high resolution uh, images of the universe. Um, this interferometry and um, aperture synthesis. So that is the reason we use multiple antennas, combine them to get a single telescope. I think the next question also, uh, you have effectively answered because the question was, uh, even a telescope, is there a way to optimize the use of radio telescope? Because even a telescope of over 45 meter will not give an image of great quality. So I think you have effectively answered that by using interferometry, multiple telescopes, aperture synthesis, we can do this. Uh, the next question is by Karthik M. 
uh, it is not directly related to what you have been talking about, but nevertheless, I'll put, for, put it uh, across. Uh, Karthik wants to know, can you give any suggestions for doing mini projects about exoplanets or any other interesting topics in astronomy? Uh, sure. I mean, you know, so probably all of us will have uh, some input for this. So, um, yes, it is uh, it is uh, possible these days, thanks, thanks to the... Um, um, all powerful internet. There are many projects in astronomy and astrophysics which are um, uh, done in, in this mode where the data is um, available um, to the public and you can actually spare some time to learn a little bit of techniques and then this data will be available to you and you can just go through this data and do this analysis and um, get interesting results as um, part of um, something which is called the citizen <laughs> science project. So, because you mentioned this exoplanet, um, I will specifically talk about that ex ex exoplanet, the amount of data that is available in any field of astronomy today is uh, mind-boggling. And it's uh, not always possible to um, comb through this, this data very, very carefully by only one or two people or a small group of people. So for many such projects, scientists ask help from uh, general public. Uh, this exoplanet is such a field where uh, such, um, uh, you know, such data exists and one can, um, in fact, get a little bit of training and start looking at the exoplanet um, data, try to um, identify new exoplanets from this uh, data and contribute to, to this uh, whole effort. Now, exoplanet is not the only one. There are other such uh, citizen science projects also. So if you, in general, search about astronomy and astrophysics citizen science project, you will get um, quite a few such programs. Okay, uh, so yes, I hope that answers. Uh, there are also, uh, I mean, if one is doing a master's and all, there are people in India who are doing, working with uh, exoplanets also, right? In IIA and Indian Institute of Astrophysics, there are some Yes, there, there, are, there are scientists at IIA mm -hmm. and also at TIFR. TIFR, yeah. Um, Bombay. And uh, yeah, particularly thinking about radio um, observation of uh, possible exoplanet, there is a group at, at TIFR now who are mm -hmm. uh, working on, on this. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, to, to uh, get involved on that type of project, you have to just you know, find out and approach those individuals. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is by Sheksha who wants to know, can these telescopes, I think this also has been answered, but very briefly, if you can just retreat, can these telescopes help us in tracing back the waves emitted at the time of Big Bang explosion and calculate the time they were emitted? Yes, so so um, um, Big Bang, I will uh, say uh, no. So let us see, I, I will just go to this slide here. So what happened is that, of course, you can um, look back using the radio wave, not just radio wave, in fact, in, in other cases also. Uh, what happened is that if you uh, look back in time, basically all the emissions that are coming towards us get started red shifting, right? We know about this concept of red shift. If you have some wave which is being emitted um, at a very early time, by the time they uh, reach us, it basically gets red shifted. It, it got towards lower and lower frequency, longer and longer wavelength because of the expansion of the universe and the space time through which it's traveling. So, um, the example here is the 21 centimeter emission I mentioned from the neutral hydrogen gas. So, when I am observing the neutral hydrogen gas from Milky Way galaxy, it's coming at 21 centimeter. If I'm looking at the neutral hydrogen gas from some other nearby galaxy, it will come more or less close to 21 centimeter, maybe a little bit longer than 21 centimeter or um, 1420 megahertz. But you go to, um, uh, you know, look back time higher and higher. Okay. By the time you reach this, this period here, the 21 centimeter signal, the 1420 megahertz signal is rated to about 150 megahertz now. Okay. So, 
radio telescopes if they are sensitive enough they will be able to pick up the neutral hydrogen signal all the way from here which will be coming at not now at 1420 megahertz but at a much lower frequency at 150 megahertz or even below that right so yes you can still detect that red shifted signal it will be at a lower frequency it has other challenges and also when it is traveling to this far distance its strength also become weaker and weaker so you need to build bigger and bigger telescope to detect this uh, signal right so when i talk about this dark ages cosmic dawn and reionization this is the overall evolution of the universe that can be traced using the neutral hydrogen signal all the way to very high red shift of course there are other studies that radio astronomers can do of low and intermediate uh, look back time by again looking at these galaxies um, they are emission in fact when i mentioned about the ag and the star like uh, sources that you see in the radio sky they are also quite far away from us the problem with going uh, further than this in fact farther than uh, almost from where we get the cmb and a little beyond that the, this uh, part of the evolution diagram that i have here this become um, completely uh, inaccessible to us because it's it's no more uh, transparent it's it become uh, opaque so we really cannot probe things after a certain range here there is uh, something called the surface of last scattering after after that the matter and radiation decoupling happen and getting information from things past that point uh, is not possible because it's not transparent anymore so so any form of electromagnetic wave not just we are not uh, uh we will not be able to observe it because of this not being transparent anymore yeah thanks for that uh, virendra uh, there are few more questions which we will take up but maybe we can take a few from youtube for uh, if there are questions uh yeah there are uh, a couple of questions um uh, so there is uh, one question on the color of images by uh, monica hade uh so i'll probably reframe uh, uh, this question is that um, so how different are the colors uh, that you see uh, in these images from the colors uh, in say an optical uh, image and what do they uh, imply right so um, so this uh, you know so i i want to uh, mention it again clearly here when i look at the the optical uh, radiation maybe i will go back to this image when i look at the sky in optical i have a uh, uh, a notion of color because color as we um, think about it or define it's like our perception our eye is sensitive to a range of wavelength and we call that as different color and we can see that different colors now this is an infrared image okay and whatever i am going to talk about infrared is also true about radio or x ray or uh, uv and so on so this infrared image here i do not even have a notion of color because my eye is not sensitive to that wavelength it is at a different wavelength so it is not red not green not blue but infrared does not have a notion of color because our human eyes and hence our brain does not associate the idea of a color to this wavelength emission however i can have a detector which look at the sky and detect how much infrared emission is coming from this different direction how do i represent that i represent that by using a intensity scaling this image even if it is colored you know this white yellowish white color all the way to this reddish dark reddish color this is just to reflect the relative intensity of the infrared emission for this different region this is only telling me that the infrared radiation is high for this region this part of orion nebula this part of orion nebula and sorry this part of the orion constellation this part of orion constellation and so on and it's not so much bright in this part that part that part and so on so this 
color scheme is what is known as a false color fall this is a false color image i am just representing the intensity the relative intensity in infrared using a color scheme of my choice okay so all the radio images that i am showing here if i show it in this way it will probably be um more closer to give you a feeling that this is just intensity even this white color here for the sources does not make any sense because radio wave does not have an associated color to our either to our eye or to our brain is the relative intensity but to show that relative intensity more clearly more visible you know the representation of the relative intensity we put a color color scheme a false color scheme so all the images when you show it to people it should come with a color bar like this you if you can see this top panel here there is a color bar which says it is in unit of millijansky per beam it is the unit of the surface brightness for radio emission this is millijansky per beam so you can read from here whatever is the color here this greenish color is basically something like 300 millijansky per beam so this gives me a relative idea about the brightness similarly this one you can see here flux density in jansky per beam so whatever point you see what is what this color actually means is related to the brightness or surface brightness of the radio wave that is coming from there it does not have anything to do with the actual notion of color because as soon as you are outside this narrow range of wavelength which our um, eye and brain can perceive outside that there is no uh, notion of color so it's just the relative brightness which we are showing by using a false color scale that is true for all of these images apart from the optical in optical also we can sometime use false color to enhance some pictures and so on but that is a different thing but outside optical the colors are basically to show you the relative uh, brightness or relative intensity thank you for that uh, let's move on to the next question and uh, so this question is uh, related to like how can you become an astronomer um, after doing engineering uh, so since you are a radio astronomer who has uh, engineering background so could you uh, shed some light on that sure yeah so so um, so there are there are two aspect one is that um uh, from the um, you know from the um, preparation point of view i will say that in astronomy and astrophysics all um topics of physics and mathematics they have some connection and utilization so if you are interested in Uh, astronomy and astrophysics you should uh, pair yourself with uh, basic physics understanding and be good with your mathematics now all engineering courses they have the um, they have the very um, exhaustive uh, mathematics courses that i uh, that i know so you know you can um put proper stress in your uh, mathematics courses as part of your curriculum what whatever is being taught and in addition to that you can probably put a little bit of your own time to uh, to learn more about basic physics uh, related to quantum mechanics thermodynamics statistical mechanics and so on this will help you to to uh, Pursue you if you really want to get into research in astronomy and astrophysics. Because even if in this presentation I am showing a lot of images and uh, colorful things and so on, all of this has come. And when you do the actual work of research, there is a lot of physics, mathematics, all the detailed calculation and everything that goes into it. So you cannot avoid that. It's not just taking a telescope and looking at the sky and making some images. It is. much more than that and having a strong physics and mathematics background is required from a practical point of view most of the institute in our country where astronomy research are done they um, uh, admit uh, be btech students in fact they are considered to be equivalent uh, to um, msc students so uh, from the point of view of getting admitted to this phd program 
there is no hurdle. Most of the institute actually uh, let BEBTEC student register for PhD program. However, the selection process, there is standard selection process that for applying for this position and being shortlisted for, uh, let us say, an interview through which the final selection will be happening. For that, you have to uh, sit for some of these national level entrance tests, um, JEST or GATE or uh, uh, CSIR, uh, UGC NET or something. Uh, where, first of all, to some extent, they will uh, check your understanding of uh, physics and graphs on mathematics. And then in the interview process, again, um, the selection process is such that they, they will uh, check how well your understanding of physics is before selecting you for this PhD position. So uh, this thing is also generally true, not only in India, but also outside India, the universities in uh, US and Europe, they also allow uh, BEBTEC student to register for PhD programs. Um, so it is very much possible, uh, but apart from being uh, motivated to do astronomy and astrophysics, you need to, um, sorry, just excuse me for one moment. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. So you, you need to prepare and make your uh, basic physics and mathematics strong so that from a pragmatic point of view, you will be able to do well in this uh, various entrance test and the interview. Yeah, Virendra, so the uh, YouTube is done. Uh, or are there more? There is, uh, there is uh, one more question. Uh, okay. Is a bit, uh, uh, specialized or technical one. So what are uh, some objects or targets that can be observed with a two element interferometer in the KU band? Probably someone who is more aware of- Two, two element interferometer in the KU band. Yes. Okay. Uh, I cannot uh, think of uh, anything right now, but uh, Maybe what I can, because, you, you know, because KU band is like quite specialized, it's like quite at the high frequency. And if it is just a two element interferometer, it will, it will depend on other details, like what sort of baseline you have and uh, what, what useful information you will probably be able to pick up. So I need to think a little bit about it to see if something, uh, some useful observation can be done, but what I can um, tell is I, I can request this this person who has asked this question to just um, you know drop me an email probably so that I, I will uh, think about it a little bit and uh, try to, to um, respond to that. If I mean I can I cannot think of a very obvious observation that can be done with just a two element interferometer in the KU band. Yeah, I think that is uh, perhaps a better option. So I'll pass on your uh, email address. Then uh, probably uh, they can ask you. Yeah, with yeah. that, uh, the questions on YouTube are done. Okay, so maybe we can go to some of them. There are uh, some questions again about SKA. Uh, so maybe first we can take some uh, questions regarding some science that can be come to SKA and then about, because there's even a question about how exactly is India involved in the SKA project. But before we come to that, maybe some science related uh, questions. Uh, how are we going to use SKA for exoplanet hunting? Then there is a question that with the help of SKA, uh, could you tackle the problem of existence of dark matter and how could you do that? And also fast radio bursts currently with Chime, it provides us with biggest catalog. Also with SKA, whether we will do. So these are some science related questions uh, regarding SKA. Okay, so so try to answer them uh, one by one. So um, SKA will have two advantages over the um, existing. Um, Okay, two main advantages over the existing uh, radio telescopes. One is that 
it will have an unprecedented sensitivity because of the collecting area. So when we talk about the square kilometer array, it's the collecting area that is going to be one square kilometer eventually. At the phase one of the square kilometer array, uh, it will be about 10% uh, of that. That is what is currently projected. So it will have a great sensitivity compared to what we currently have in all these different bands, okay? The second thing is that it will have very long baselines. Baselines means over which region, over what size these telescope elements, the antennas are distributed. And if that is much bigger, as I mentioned, that it gives us a higher resolution. Higher resolution means we can look at uh, things at much greater details. So, with this higher resolution and higher sensitivity, SK will be able to do cutting edge science in all these fields that I sort of, you know, listed here, but did not really go through any of these details. It will have the ability to uh, pick up uh, things like details of protoplanetary disk, for example, right? The, you can see things like the um, uh, formation stage of um, planets in, in, in a way. So if you have the uh, resolution which is uh, suitable for that, you, will, you can learn more about how planets form. In terms of detecting the exoplanet itself, the radio emission can come from uh, uh, basically the, the, the mechanism is the star planet interaction. So you need to have a certain favorable condition in which the star planet interaction will be happening, which will give rise to um, emission at radio wavelengths. One can think of uh, um, something like the the aurora signal in earth where you have like uh, you know it's it's a star planet interaction uh, signal essentially you have the earth's magnetosphere and then the uh, solar wind is sort of coming and continuously interacting with the magnetosphere that is giving rise to certain type of electromagnetic signal so if the condition is favorable where this type of radio signal can be uh, picked up from the exoplanet directly, that is, uh, that is one uh, way of, of doing it. There can be also um, uh, Jupiter bus like signal, but uh, even with the SK sensitivity, it will not be very easy to uh, detect to a good distance unless the uh, burst are like uh, uh, really, really strong. So there are a few, few ways of basically um, studying exoplanet uh, that SK will open up. So that is about the exoplanet. Sorry, I forgot now. What, what was the... Dark matter, um, like what, uh, problem, existence of dark matter, could you shed light on what course of action will be adopted for its yes. detection? Yeah. So so in, in, in uh, again, in radio astronomy, the dark matter... Uh, the study of dark matter can come, th come through um, three different channels. One is that you look at uh, structures like galaxy and study how the galaxy dynamics is and try to infer the properties of dark matter from there. And this has been done for a long time now, in the sense that you look at the neutral hydrogen gas disk of the galaxy, you do a Doppler imaging to find out how fast it is rotating at various distances. And you can model that and find out about the density distribution of dark matter in, in that galaxy and try to see what you can learn from there if you do it for a large number of galaxies and do it at different red shift, what do you learn? But the second way the dark matter effect, the overall um, evolution is the structure formation, how this um, Differ, you know, not just the galaxy, but the but the other large scale structures and the presence of dark matter at those scales. So one once again, uh, one can look at this from the from the point of view of the large scale structure study. You uh, with the SK, it will be possible to map the 
distribution of baryonic matters, distribution of these galaxies and the clusters of galaxies and the filamentary structures and so on, up to a very large distance and at a much greater details. And that will eventually also tell something about this uh, dark matter component. The third one is there is certain indirect detection experiment, which um, th there has been there has been some effort already where um, different particle physics model of dark matter essentially uh, predict certain electromagnetic uh, signature also in the sense that it's not direct electromagnetic signature from the dark matter, but it's certain dark matter decay channels from so here I'm really going into a particle physics perspective in the sense that there are various ex extension of the standard model of particle physics, which predict the existence of certain type of particles, which can be dark matter candidates. So let us say uh, you take what is known as the WIMP, the, the weakly interacting massive particle model of dark matter. Can WIMP be a dark matter candidate? So if, if you assume a certain mass of these particles, and the interaction cross section and, and so on, it will have some prediction of their possible decay into standard model particle, including decay into, for example, electron and positron. Now, if you have this extra electron and positron, which is um, coming out as a decay product from your dark matter, in presence of a weak uh, astrophysical magnetic field, they should contribute a little excess in the synchrotron emission from these sources. So there is already some effort which are going on to uh, look for this signature for, for example, in say dwarf spheroidal galaxy, which otherwise would have almost no synchrotron emission. Do we see some synchrotron emission from dwarf spheroidal galaxies? And people try to understand from that if certain type of particle physics model of dark matter can be ruled out or can be established or something. So again, very sensitive radio observation can um, help us to either rule out or detect that signal. Uh, then it will be a step forward to understand about dark matter. And there was a third... Uh, fast thing, radio think, burst. Fast, fast radio, radio burst. burst. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, fast radio burst um, is... Um, okay, I, I cannot really comment much about it because uh, it's uh, somewhat uh, far from my uh, field of expertise, but um, one thing which I, which I understand is that SK will also be a great transient machine. Transient means whatever sources of um, uh, emission which is short-lived, okay? This can be um, fast radio bus, this can be other transient also, um, but it will be transient machine in the sense that it will have the capability of carrying out observation of a large area in the sky because the way the instrument is designed, it is it, it will have a large field of view. Field of view means the area of the sky that you can observe at a time. And so it will have a large field of view and it will have the back end, the, the way you deal with the signal, it will have the back end to give you a very high uh, time and frequency resolution data, which means that this will be an instrument which will be very suitable to carry out blind search for transient over a large region of the sky. Okay. Now, for fast radio burst, of course, you need high time resolution data, high frequency resolution data, so that you can get more information about uh, something called their um, DM, the dispersion measure, so that you can estimate sort of at what distance they are uh, uh, from us. Okay. And then sensitivity. Do, right now, probably we can only detect the tip of the iceberg of the very bright FRBs, the very bright fast radio burst. But if you have enough sensitivity of this surface that you are looking at the large part of the sky and you can pick up the strong as well as the weak burst, this will give us a large sample of population of FRBs, which will hopefully help us to understand details about that. You will also be able to try to identify the counterpart. So you detect some fast radio burst. Is it possible to identify with another source in this direction or something to do that? You basically need to have, again, this uh, high resolution, large scale uh, image, which are taken simultaneously. So once you have a counter source identification that the, the FRB is hosted 
the the the, fa the fast radio buzz that has been detected can be identified to be coming from this galaxy or that galaxy if you can do that that tells us more information about um, uh, these sources and most of these are completely unknown today even with the chime uh, producing a large catalog of frb very recently the uh, identification of counterpart is very very challenging and sk will um, contribute in in that direction and hence we will be able to learn about a large population and their host and hopefully this will give us some some direction about uh, understanding the nature of these sources i also forgot to mention that uh, sk will also be able to record data over large frequency range simultaneously so even this spectral property of these transient sources not just frb for any other sources that will also be a simultaneous useful information okay uh, so we'll move on to the next question uh, the ne uh, again i'll club a couple of questions which talk uh, which are uh, related to the propagation of radio waves and these are asked by vigneshwaran and anshita um, like sometimes the radio waves at low frequency emission might get lost due to propagation or may get contaminated so how are these low radio frequency uh, low frequency radio signals identified this is one part the other part is about doing radio astronomy in space so will it help to do in uh, so in that sense i just put these two questions together yeah so um, so yes both of both of these are um, very valid points so one thing is if you uh, look at this atmospheric opacity that i showed earlier you will see that even at the um low the higher end of this that is longer wavelength end of the radio band um the atmosphere the earth atmosphere actually block the emission so it's it it has to be like um within certain range um in the radio band so that we can do this ground based observation um and it happened mostly because the atmosphere here become um Uh, reflective and that th this is the reason we can actually listen to our radios the you know set aside radio astronomy we can listen to the radio programs i'm not talking about the fm the the older days am and um, the short wave uh, medium wave radio program because you basically have um the the transmitter which is uh, sending the waves and it is reflecting from the ionosphere and then coming to your receiver and you can listen to the radio programs so uh, the same ionosphere which become uh, highly reflective it at the at the longer wavelength it of course distort the wave um, even at a, a range where it is uh, somewhat transparent and there are ways of correcting it so there are calibration processes which uh, try to uh, solve and correct for how much distortion the atmosphere and ionosphere is doing to the radio wave which is passing through the earth atmosphere now it is not that always you can do this correction to the best possible way that you want to do if the ionospheric condition for some reason is too bad then some of the observation can get completely washed out because the ionosphere distort your um radio wave so much that it, it it you cannot basically take the image you can think of it almost like uh, you know you were looking you were looking through an ionosphere which is distorting things so much that whatever image you get are not uh, usable okay but most of the time you will be able to take care of it offline by using certain techniques of calibration to uh, to um undo the effect of atmosphere and ionosphere for a range of radio frequency there is there is the very low radio frequency range the very long wavelength range where of course we cannot do anything it is completely uh, opaque and the only way to uh, look at that is to um, again take your receiver take your telescope um, high above the ionosphere um, the atmosphere now uh, so from that point of view yes there there is distortion introduced by the atmosphere and ionosphere it comes from the ionosphere mostly at the low frequency lower end of the frequency at the higher end of the frequency it also comes from the atmosphere because the water vapor actually start absorbing things and you can correct for it to some extent to a good extent 
um but once in a while it it may be uh, beyond the limit that you cannot correct then you can just wait for a better time when the ionosphere is more well behaved um it has a connection with uh, by the way it has a connection with the solar activity cycle the 11 years if there is a lot of solar activity then your ionosphere behave more erratically and it become more and more painful to do that uh, correction and get an accurate correction it it become Uh, you know more problematic with higher solar activity with the quiet sun it's uh, it's better i have not talked about uh, because it came to my mind in this context i have not talked about one more very challenging thing for ground based radio astronomy which has to do with what is called the radio frequency interference so um, uh all our uh, mobile and uh, tv signal and radio signal and uh, microwaves and some uh, faulty carburetor in a car etc all of these produce lot of uh, radio wave emission and if it is happening all these things are happening close to your radio telescope then of course these are picked up by radio telescope as some unwanted terrestrial uh, contribution to the signal and one need to get rid of it before you do any processing of the data and try to make the image of the sky now both of these uh problem sort of push one to think about whether things can be better if you go to space the space of course give you another advantage of getting a very long baseline that the distance between the antennas can become very very large you are not bound by the earth diameter in this case you can make it even longer than earth diameter right so there has been some effort to do that in fact there has been space based vlbi which people have tried successfully they have uh, uh, got uh, some very high resolution images using space based vlbi you can do, do it in two ways you can keep even one antenna on the ground and another in the in the space and you know in a in an orbit but the but the problem with all of this is that you can neither send a very big radio telescope to the sky okay so this will be like smaller receivers smaller antennas okay neither you can do it with a large number of them it will be very hard to uh, have you know an interferometric array or something you can have few elements right so there has been some limited uh, limited um, effort in in this direction there is one um, very interesting idea which has taken a good step already which is to uh, solve for both of these issues that is the radio frequency interference as well as problem due to the ionosphere and atmosphere why not use the moon okay so uh, you know part so so because of the tidal locking there is the far side of the moon which does not see anything from the earth at all so if one can actually deploy a radio telescope on that side the far side of the moon it will actually be shielded from all the radio frequency interference produced on earth and moon does not have atmosphere so it does not have ionosphere atmosphere so that is we is also solved so there is a very uh, interesting proposal which is which is at a at a very uh, advanced stage of uh, consideration i think it's called uh, sorry i i don't remember the name but it's basically a cosmology experiment which is um, the way it's planned is that the instrument will be on the far side of the moon so yes so space based and not just on the orbit but even uh, space based radio astronomy from uh, radio telescopes in moon all these are uh, being considered and there is some as i said some limited success also already with the space vlbi aspect yeah so just take one final question i know already it's a bit late but uh, uh, this is by keshav who wants to know is something planned with sk to observe in the outer solar system because uh, we didn't mention that uh, uh outer solar system sorry i i am not really aware of uh, if there is a specific plan of outer solar system observation with the sk but um uh, radio, uh, you know this this radio telescopes they are used for studying uh, asteroids um it's it's basically um, effectively the same technology as doing um uh, your radar imaging uh, type of thing so learning more about um, small small uh, bodies small body system in solar system like like asteroids 
एस के कैन बी यूजेबल इंजीनियरिंग because uh, it it is a very big project and india will be part of it yes so before we close yes. maybe you can mention a bit about that yeah yes yeah so so the so the current and so so far in all the activities of the sk during its um, planning and design phase india has taken a very active role and as i mentioned that <coughs> the the telescope management the, the earlier the name of the system was the telescope management now it has been renamed to the observatory management and control system the omc this is sort of the system which will control the whole operation of the telescope like all these you know large number of antenna elements how you move them together how you send various commands to look at which direction of the sky and so on how data come back and you record everything so the entire management and control of the telescope will be done using this omc system and india played the lead role during the planning and designing of the uh, omc system Okay. it also played a role during the uh, designing of the antenna receiver and the csp the central signal processing uh, part and is expected to contribute to um, these working groups as well in the international collaboration so there will be involvement from india in the omc not just involvement omc india is expected to lead the the production of the omc the management and control system and these other systems uh, during the during a period of as i mentioned it, you know sk has entered the the uh, construction phase uh, last year so during this construction phase india is expected to be involved in uh, this omc systems as, as well as the antenna system and receiver system for both sk mid and low um, plus the central signal processing system okay so uh that that is the aspect where there will be involvement not only of the radio astronomers but also the uh, the engineering aspect of it all the engineering aspect of it in which india will be contributing and the industries from india they are also expected to be uh, involved in this the over plan so far the the uh, proposal um, that is um at a very advanced level of consideration by the government is that um india wants to be um contributing at a 6% level overall for the construction and operation of sk which means that india will uh, have the same um percentage of time available so about 6% of the time of the sk observatory when it uh, start observation that time share uh, will be available to the indian science community now <clears throat> there is another very um, challenging aspect and i did not really get into the details of it but you can imagine from here if you have a telescope which has 130000 antennas and you are combining signal from them or even 200 antenna spread over 150 km and you want to combine signal from them and remember both these numbers are for phase 1 only so there will be a phase 2 where this number will jump this number will jump to 3000 right so all of these are very very challenging in terms of managing the data how what what data do you record how do you um, archive the data how do you analyze that huge volume of data and so on so computationally also there are so many challenges which sk will pose before us as the construction progress and india is also again expected to play a major role there in terms of uh, developing what is called the sk regional center so the idea is that there will be multiple regional data center spread all over the globe and one of such data center is supposed to be hosted in india so in terms of developing this entire computation facility in india india will also be uh, taking an active part so these are few of the things in which we uh, expect active uh, participation from the community not just the 
radio astronomers but as I, as i mentioned there are a lot of engineering challenges there are a lot of data science related challenges there are a lot of computers and related challenges so involvement of of uh, engineering um, students institutes where uh, research related to these are happening so you can see that when i talk about more than 20 member institutes it's not only research institute like ncra or rri or iuka or iist there are uh, IIA, iits and nits which are also part of this sk india consortium so that not just the science but both science and technological capabilities of the indian community um, can come together towards this contribution to building the square kilometer array and accordingly we will have also access to the uh, telescope when it is operating yeah there are i think more questions but i would request them to uh, write to nirupam since uh, we have already exceeded our time so uh, those who have more questions please don't hesitate to write to him at iisc you can get his email from uh, the iisc website uh, now we will move uh, towards uh, the closure of this session so formally uh, we thank dr nirupam for the wonderful introduction to radio astronomy and the square kilometer array uh, he has provided us with an overview of the radio telescopes and how they work that the radio sky is different from the sky as we see with our eyes was also very nicely elucidated by him finally he described the upcoming square kilometer array as well as the science that is possible with it so on behalf of asi poec we thank our participants in zoom and our youtube viewers as well for actively taking part in the discussion uh, we will be back soon with a new topic of discussion so do join in thank you and bye